for this is a Kids in Worship Sunday. Several times throughout the year, we uh, don't have creation stations, so we think about the ways that we can incorporate uh, the children of our church into worship. We've done some rethinking around Kids in Worship Sundays over this last year and trying out some new things. So kids, if you are out there, can everybody look up at me? If grown-ups, uh, if you've got some kids with you, g- grab their attention and have them pay attention to what's going on up here just for a little bit, and then we'll let them get back to their art project. Um, I actually am going to read a book this morning that maybe some of you kids and maybe some of you adults have uh, seen before. Anybody ever read this book before? Okay, a few of you out there know this. So we're going to read through it today as a church and uh, see what it can teach us today. So the book is Have You Filled a Bucket Today? All day long, everyone in the whole wide world walks around carrying an invisible bucket. There we go. (laughs) You can't see it, but it's there. You have a bucket. Each member of your family has a bucket. Your grandparents, friends, and neighbors all have buckets. Everyone carries an invisible bucket. Your bucket has one purpose only. Its purpose is to hold your good thoughts and good feelings about yourself. You feel happy and good when your bucket is full, and you feel sad and lonely when your bucket is empty. Other people feel the same way too. They're happy when their buckets are full, and they're sad when their buckets are empty. It's great to have a full bucket, and this is how it works. Other people can fill your bucket, and you can fill theirs. You can fill your own bucket, too. So how do you fill a bucket? You fill a bucket when you show love to someone, when you say or do something kind, or even when you give someone a smile. That's being a bucket filler. A bucket filler is a loving, caring person who says and does nice things to make others feel special. When you treat others with kindness and respect, you fill their bucket. But you can also dip into a bucket and take out some of the good feelings. You dip into a bucket when you make fun of someone, when you say or do mean things, and when you ignore someone. That's bucket dipping. Bullying is bucket dipping. When you hurt others, you dip into their bucket. And you will dip into your own bucket too. Many people who dip have an empty bucket. They may think they can fill their own bucket by dipping into someone else's, but that will never work. You never fill your own bucket when you dip into someone else's. But guess what? When you fill someone else's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. You feel good when you help others feel good. All day long, we are either filling up or dipping into each other's buckets by what we say and what we do. Try to fill a bucket and see what happens. You love your mom and dad. Why not tell them that you love them? You can even tell them why. Your caring words will fill their buckets with joy. Watch for smiles to light up on their faces. You will feel like smiling too. A smile is a good clue that you have filled a bucket. If you practice, you'll become a great bucket filler. Just remember that everyone carries an invisible bucket and think of what you can say or do to fill it. Here are some ideas for you. You could smile and say hi to the bus driver. He has a bucket too. You could invite a new kid at school to play with you. You could write a thank you note to your teacher. You could tell your grandpa that you like spending time with him 
There are many ways to fill a bucket. Bucket filling is fun and easy to do. It doesn't matter how young or old you are. It doesn't cost money and it doesn't take much time. And remember, when you fill someone else's bucket, you fill your own bucket too. When you're a bucket filler, you make your home, your school, and your neighborhood better places for all. Bucket filling makes everyone feel good. So why not decide to be a bucket filler today and every day? Just start each day by saying to yourself, I'm going to do something to fill somebody's bucket today. And at the end of the day, ask yourself, did I fill the bucket today? Yes, I did. That's the life of a bucket filler. And that's you. Have you filled a bucket today? The end. Okay, kids, you are welcome to continue to pay attention to me up here or work on your art project or do both, which I know many of you do. So we are in um, our series, our Advent series, called um, Expressing Our Joy. And I have to tell you, it is so fun every single Sunday to watch you all come through the doors. And some of you just can't wait to get your coat open so that you can show me your sweater for today or your hat or whatever else you might have on today. Here's a Clues family from a few Sundays ago um, in all of their festive clothing. Now, if you didn't get a chance to wear a festive sweater or a festive shirt, do not fear, as the angels say, because next Sunday we are still in this series. So the Sunday after Christmas um, is our last Sunday of this series, and you are free to wear your Christmas sweaters uh, next Sunday, which actually is the season of, Christ- of Christmas in the Christian church. Now, I notice that many of you are carrying your festivity to other parts of your life. Um, I got a uh, text message from a gentleman from our congregation this last week. Our head usher, our usher coordinator, John Hafer, um, wore his festive gear to worship, uh, to his job in one of our local schools this last week. John could not help but text me this picture of himself on Friday. Today we are going to talk about ways to spread our joy around. Uh, I want to do some acknowledging um, some things from last Sunday of folks just sharing their joy with others. Um, Of course, we had our our Christmas cantata, our chapel choir, and our brass ensemble, and many of our special musicians offering their gifts last Sunday, offering their joy, spreading their joy, sharing their joy last Sunday. Um, And of course, our children in the Christmas program at our 1030 worship, this was their opportunity to spread their joy and to share it with us. And then last Sunday night, um, I want to acknowledge the work of our Caring Ministry team. They held uh, a beautiful and meaningful service down at our Cottage Grove campus, um, recognizing that Christmas isn't always the happiest time of the year. And um, there's times that we need to find those breakthroughs, find that healing and reconciliation and restoration. And um, I just appreciated the Caring Ministry team and the work that they did last Sunday night. Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, I preached, and I preached on um, the angels and the shepherds. Uh, Today we're going to get a continuation of that story, kind of what happens next in that story. Uh, Of course, those shepherds were out in their field. They were minding their own business, doing what they should be doing, tending their flock, when all of a sudden there was an angel of the Lord that came to them bringing good news, wonderful, joyous news, saying, Hey, shepherds, guess what? There is a Savior that has been born. Don't be scared about this. You should go and find uh, this baby. And here's your clue. The baby's wrapped in cloth and line in a manger. Then there was a whole bunch of angels that came, and they were praising and glorifying God, adoration, and uh, after that big scene was all over, the angels went away, and the shepherds were left standing there looking at each other going, well, best, best we better go. So they found their way to Bethlehem, found Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, 
And that's where our scripture picks up today from Luke 2. So the shepherds went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. The shepherds experienced the good news. They experienced the good news. They experienced Jesus. And after they experienced that, they couldn't help but spread it around, share this good news with others. And we can look at this scripture and ask ourselves the question, well, how did they share it with others? In which manner did the shepherds share this good news, what they had experienced with others? And as I look at this scripture, I notice some ways that they actually don't share it with others. We don't see the shepherds uh, making some intellectual argument or making some kind of rational, reasonable explanation for what they had experienced. We don't see the shepherds making a great argument, a persuasive explanation for what they had experienced. We don't see the shepherds out there bragging Like, hey, we've got this good news and you don't have it for you. Not that. We don't see them doing this in a demeaning way. We don't see them going out there like, hey, we got the good news. You guys don't have the good news. It's not how the shepherds shared this. Instead, they shared it by glorifying and praising God. They shared this news through glorifying and praising God. And you know why? One suspicion is. This is how the angel shared it with them. Because if you look back at the previous scripture, it talks about the angels praising and glorifying God. So when the shepherds, had to go and share it. They did it in the very same way. This is an example of one thing leading to the next. You experience it, you share it with others, and they share it in the same way that it was shared with you. It's kind of like the bucket filling a little bit. Somebody fills your bucket, now you've got a full bucket, and you want to fill somebody else's bucket. Now, I am part of uh, several different Facebook groups, like community groups that are out there. I know that many of you are part of those same groups because I see you out there on Facebook. Uh, These groups are um, just people that are from the same area, the same city, the same town, the same area, and they all become part of a group on Facebook. And the purpose and intention of these groups is so that you can share information back and forth. So that if you're looking for a recommendation, you can uh, ask, hey, I need to get my car fixed someplace. Does anybody have any recommendations for that? Or, hey, I know this really great event that's happening at this school or this church. Um, I just want to let everybody know about it. Um, Hey, I'm having some issues with this one thing. Is anybody else having some issues with this one thing? Now, I have to tell you that as a pastor, it's really helpful to be part of these Facebook groups. And the reason for that is it helps me keep a pulse on the community, to pay attention to what's going on, what people are talking about in a particular area. It helps me read the context of of the work that I'm doing. So it's very helpful for that reason. Um, It's also really helpful because every once in a while, there'll be somebody on there that is looking for a recommendation on a church. Well, I know how to answer those questions. Hi, I'm the pastor of the Grove, and I want to let you know that we have a great church, and we would love for you to come to worship some some Sunday and worship with us, and you will feel welcomed at our church. I also know that uh, many of you um, are part of these Facebook groups, um, and you are serving on ministry teams, and you are putting out our events. Um, on these Facebook groups so that people from our area can see 
what we're about and what we're doing, and I thank you for uh, those of you who are doing that important work. For the most part, I find these groups really good, very helpful for me, helpful for others. But every once in a while, there will be something that shows up where it just turns into complaining and rudeness and bitiness. And uh, this last week, um, I found that on one of these groups. So here's kind of what happened. There was a dad, um, and his son, his elementary child, came home complaining that the school would not let him wear his Santa hat as one of the dress-up days. Um, yes, we have somebody walking out with a Santa hat right now. <laughs> would not let um, his school wear a Santa hat inside the building as part of the dress-up days. And... Um, the dad, had, I think, had a good intention about that. It was kind of sharing some information, trying to create some community dialogue around this particular issue. Now, I have to be honest with you, I have no idea what the school district policy is. I'm sure some of you who are employees of the school district or, or uh, parents or students in the school district may have heard, but it seems as if there has been some kind of policy change on this for the school district. And when I hear things like this, my first instinct is to, I tend to trust the school leaders. I was part of public education for a lot of years, and um, I would watch leaders of school districts make really difficult decisions, um, intentional decisions, walking fine lines, uh, having to work with gray areas, and try to communicate to that to the school district. So um, I know that there is hard work behind the decisions. And because I've worked in schools, I also recognize that schools sometimes do get it wrong, how it's communicated, how it's, interpret how it's interpreted. Um, sometimes they make a decision and have to go back on it because they realize, wait, we missed a few things on there, and they try to do that with grace and honesty. It's not up to me to debate the merits of the policy change, whatever that was. Um, there's uh, not only on those Facebook groups that I see it pop up, but just in my regular feed, it was popping up too. But what I want to talk about is what happens when one thing leads to the next. Just like the shepherds shared the good news with praise and adoration, or the angels shared the good news with praise or adoration, and then the shepherds went out there and, sh and shared it with praise or adoration, it can work the same way negatively. So the post was put up, and the last time I looked, there was over 400 comments on this one post. And there was a lot of complaining, and there was a lot of rudeness, and there was a lot of anger, and there was a lot of arguing over the merits of cultural sensitivity. And uh, some Christians were playing into the idea that um, they were being persecuted because this child couldn't wear a Santa hat to school. Other people were on there trying to explain the school district's position and the nuance of it and the gray area on it. And I almost found myself making a comment myself. I didn't, but this is what I wanted to say. I wanted to say, a Santa hat. You're worried about Christianity because a child can't wear a Santa hat. I wonder if there might be a better symbol of Christianity than a Santa hat. When I was reading it through the comments, I was thinking about this Santa hat, about how this child wanted to spread his joy, share his joy with his school and his friends. And there were some boundaries that were placed on it. And there's a lot of choices that could have been made at that point, and maybe the parents made some of these choices. The child could wear it out shopping in the community. The, the child could wear it with family members and relatives. The child could wear it to a church that encourages him to wear festive gear during the Advent season. A lot of different ways to share the joy and spread the joy. This symbol that was meant to be something meaningful around joy became a symbol 
of negativity, of rudeness, of anger, of annoyance, because one thing led to the next in 400 Facebook posts. The same thing happened several years ago around Starbucks. Does anybody remember this with Starbucks a few years ago? So Starbucks put out a note asking their employees to uh, say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas. So there were some Christians that got really upset by this and uh, decided to boycott Starbucks during the Christmas season. And then there was another group of Christians that decided to do something interesting. When you go out to order your Starbucks, you give your order, and then they ask you for your name, right? What do they do with your name? Put it on the cup, and then when your order's ready, what do they do? Say your name. Okay, so there was a group of Christians that said, if we tell them that our name is Merry Christmas, when our drink is ready, they're going to yell out Merry Christmas to get around it. And I have to tell you, when I see stuff like this, I actually get worried about the message that we as Christians are sending to our society. If sharing our joy and spreading our joy is making ourselves and other people angry, we probably are doing it wrong. If sharing our faith is making other people angry, we might want to rethink how we are spreading joy. I uh, found this quote, um, it's not all of it, that's okay Dan, I'll read it. Um, I found this quote on um, Instagram the other, um, the other, this last week, it actually is uh, by a blogger that I really like, and here's the full quote. I'm a Christian. When someone says happy holidays to me, I simply smile and reply, you as well. I don't lecture them or insist on them acknowledging Christmas. Because I'm a Christian and not a jerk. Now, wait. (laughs) This is what I want to say about this. We can talk about negativity leading to negativity, right? There is a subtle poke in this about how Christians will poke at other Christians. Like, Christians calling each other jerks really is that, really spreading our joy and sharing our joy too. Now, I um, recognize that we could go down this path, and you might hear me saying to you, Kelly, you're just telling us to be nice all the time. Put on the Christian happy face. Go around and just be that nice, good Christian. And I want you to know that's not exactly what I'm encouraging you to do. I do want you to share the joy of your faith with others, and I also recognize that our faith calls us to speak up and speak out when we see injustice in the world. We need to be speaking up and speaking out for the things that Jesus cared about. So one more meme for you today. Want to keep Christ in Christmas? Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked, forgive the guilty, welcome the stranger and the unwanted child, care for the ill, and love your enemies. How do we share our Christian witness? How do we share the joy of our faith? Paying attention to the things that mattered to Jesus as we do that sharing. It requires us to be intentional and reflective on what the priorities of Jesus, what this whole season is about, and acting in ways that Jesus would. This is witnessing to our faith. We can do it negatively. We can do it joyfully. We can do it with annoyance. Or we can do it with praise in adoration, we can spend time complaining, or we can spend time 
doing. We can spend time complaining or we can spend time doing. People of the Grove, we are in a long line of messengers, of witnesses. The angels to the shepherds, the shepherds to other all sharing good news. The people that the shepherds shared it with to the next group, to the next group, to the next group. For 2,000 years, this message has been shared. And it has changed lives. Until it got to us. We got the good news. And it changed our lives too. Wants us, it, it, it makes us want to spread joy. It makes us want to witness to that faith with praise and adoration. It makes us want to spread joy through bucket filling, through telling our parents we love them, sharing with our grandpa that we like spending time with him, saying hello to the bus driver, asking the new kid to play on the playground. And we spread our joy and share our faith through feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and welcoming the stranger. This is our witness, spreading the joy of our faith. Amen. I'd invite you to stand and we'll sing together.